you know where we are if you've been watching some of my other Athens videos, but this is a little bit of a special one for my car friends. Some people are watching this because they know me from the classic car world where I broker and deal in collector automobiles, maybe collector watches. I have a lot of jobs, not just bringing Athens and the Greek islands and Turkey and various other places in the future to you. But uh, today we're going to head over to the Hellenic Motor Museum, which is uh, north of Monastiraki by some bit. And I had to run something back to the hotel room, so we're now approaching the Acropolis station. So we're going to go down into the metro. Armed with only the Athena card and the camera. There we go. Here it is, the Hellenic Motor Museum. It says the capital Athenian on top. We have a green light. Green means go. Hellenic Motor Museum. Entrance, cashier, four. Up we go. A panther. I haven't seen a panther in a while. Last time, last time I think I saw a panther, it looked very much like that. It was on the streets of Richmond, Virginia. And a Marlin. Another very small production, limited production English car. So it's important to note that the entrance is on the fourth floor. After I tried to go through the doors on the ground floor, they sent me up here. So we've just gone through, paid the admission price, very reasonable, 10 euros. And we've got a replica old car workshop set up here. Really nice display, some porcelain signs, a little Morris Minor, early Morris Minor convertible, undergoing some repairs. It was probably a popular car here in Greece in that era. Model T Ford, very early car. Right-hand steer. Oh, it's a Model N even, even earlier. A couple of friends of mine have Model Ns. An Italian Diato. American LaFrance Speedster, a Speedster made from a fire truck. I had the fortune of selling one of these at one time. Let's see if I can get a little better light on this. These are giant cars because they were fire trucks, and some of them are cut more than others. This one really is not very well cut, uh, or not cut very much, rather. And it doesn't need to be because the engine carries it. She's weeping a little oil there, boys. But, uh, you know, a lot of fun in a big package. My friend Gary Wales out in California, and of course people like Jay Leno have cars like that as well. A 1927 Lincoln. Might have had a, one of those, one or two of those pass through my hands. I'm sorry about the lighting. I'm going to see if I can do a little bit better about that. It's a little dark in here. Another Lincoln. 1923, and I'm thinking that this bodybuilder, we're going to look at the board down here. We've got some information on the car. And I don't see the bodybuilder, but I had a Hudson with a very similar uh, windshield treatment to that Lincoln, and I kind of want to say that the body's probably by the same company, unless it's... Uh, internal and they were just using that design fairly commonly but with the little side lights there a series 80 chrysler 1928 a voisin roadster french avion voisin 1926 with a boat tail proving already to be everything my friend myron Vernus said and more a really good display A Willis Whippet 6. I had a Speedster uh, made from a very similar whip Willis. This is a 1929. Mine was, I think, a 26 or 7. These are great little cars, six-cylinder cars, and they get up and go. Very underappreciated. A lot of these cars from the 1920s are lost on a lot of new, newer, younger people today. A Nash. 19... 26 and she's got front brakes unlike a friend of mine's 22. I used to run people around weddings Very similar body very similar instrument panel, but four-wheel brakes 
nice big open touring car, again, very underappreciated by the younger generation, which is what I meant to say a moment ago. I believe we have a Packard here. Mid-20s, late-20s, 28. Close enough. Model 443. A senior car. Looks like it was bought at a bottoms auction at one point. It's got their sticker on it. A Hudson. We're just talking about Hudsons. So my Hudson, not dissimilar roof line, not dissimilar front end. This is a 24. I want to say the one I had was a 24 as well. But it had, look at the flat windshield on the Hudson here. Now look at the windshield back on the seven-passenger Lincoln. If you can picture that roof line on that Hudson, that would make it the car I had. And the car I had even was blue and black, just like the Lincoln. We have a Rolls-Royce, a small horsepower car. Note the short nose. So it's a 20 horsepower Doctor's Coupe 1926. Body by Hooper. So Hooper made swoopier cars later on. And even here, that's a very distinctive rear end. The early Rolls guys would probably peg that a lot quicker than I did for a Hooper. A Daimler, not a Daimler, but a Daimler, an English-made car later owned by Birmingham Small Arms and then by Jaguar under British Leyland. 1922 Daimler. Doctor's Coupe, dicky seats in the back, meaning a little folding similar to a rumble seat. Another English car, a Humber from 1919. And it was gifted to a vice admiral who was uh, in staff here in Greece. So it looks like it spent its whole life here. And a little dicky or rumble seat in the back. Let's make our way around. And then we've got a hole upstairs with some more contemporary cars. But I think we're going to Ignore the directions. We're going to look at the little Abarth Coupe. 750 Zagato, little Monza, 1959. These have become more valuable in recent years. If you see any that have the double bubble in the roof, incredibly more valuable. But the little Abarths, great little cars. Sports car race to death back in the early days when they were practically brand new cars. Here we have a uh, 365 BB, early Ferrari Berlinetta Boxer. Uh, this being in 1974, so really the first year of production of the BB, uh, first year for the flat 12 after the Daytonas. Uh, they were still making a couple of Daytonas for U.S. consumption while this model came out for Europe. They really just crossed over. V12 E-Type Jag, right-hand drive, automatic transmission, but no air conditioning, so... Typical English specification car. This gives none of that history, so but we're going to just make an educated guess. But a lovely red V12 E-type across the way. We have a uh, 250 GTE, one of the last production 250s. This 2 plus 2. Enzo Ferrari himself used to like these cars. They're big and comfortable and fast for their day. They've never been among the most valuable 250s, but they are coming up. A rising tide lifts all boats. And just a little collection of steering wheels throughout the ages. A lot of sporty looking steering wheels. American, Italian. German, obviously, 356. AC Cobra, America. Jeep, NSU, fun stuff. Very fortunate to have the museum almost to myself today, unlike all of the people out in Monterey who are fighting over the crowds. A Maserati Comson, 1976. Maserati at this point was uh, part of Citroën 
And some of these Maseratis, I'm not going to go so far as to say this Maserati, I, though I suspect it does. I think the Comsen has at least the Citroen uh, hydropneumatic braking power brake system with the spheres in it. It's a little extra complication for servicing. And a Lamborghini Espada. Really neat grand touring cars. Remember the times when you could pick up a nice Espada for twenty-five or thirty thousand dollars, and now they've become very expensive, even though they're two plus two cars. Very, very expensive. This is a pretty car in blue over red. Very European color combination for this Espada. Backside of a Maserati 3500 GT. I'm going to have to walk around the front of those, so we're just going to stay with these here at the moment. A 365 GT4 2 plus 2. Um, this was the new look, still a front engine V12, unlike the Berlinetta Boxers. Um, a lot of the styling cues of the Daytona and a lot of the newer styling cues as well, obviously Pininfarina design car. And this, a right-hand drive example, so unusual. Real unusual car. Again, not one of the most valuable Ferraris of its era, but uh, very pleasurable to drive when you've got a well sorted example. A friend of mine really likes these Alfa Romeo 2600s. This is a 2600 Sprint, 1962. A good driver quality example here, great for tours. Alancia, Flaminia GT, a three carb. Very pretty, super legera styling. Touring. Interior is a little weak in her, but they have unique seating. I don't know if I can get in on the seats enough there, but they have those big wide side bolsters on them. This one seems to have uh, French stickers on it from a bygone era. An Issa Revolta Lele, 1974 Iso. I don't have a whole lot of uh, experience with the ESOs. Uh, American power, Italian design. Interesting combination. This is a Ford uh, Cleveland V8 powered car. Maserati Ghibli SS of so the 4.9. Pretty car, 1969 model, Ghibli SS. Pretty blue over tan. Beige, maybe. No, she's tan with blue carpet. And unusual with the automatic transmission on a Ghibli. An unusual car. Maybe not the most desirable, but definitely rarer than the five speed. Alpha Montreal. Got a little bit of a leak out of control here on the Montreal, but uh, probably sits around a lot. Unusual here, Oscar, the original Maserati company, when Maserati was bought and sold, a typical Italian uh, hostile takeover. 1500S Coupe, 1959 Oscar, Pininfarina, blue over red. Real nice little car. Oscar built racing cars as well as cars for the road, mostly racing, really. We have a collection of trophies here ostensibly from a Greek uh, organization. Let me see if I can get in close on it and interpret a little bit of this. The Automobile and Touring Club of Greece, ELPA, all their trophies and awards, lots of little pieces of memorabilia, probably those of the founder of this museum, a man who uh, was very highly regarded and just passed away recently. So we looked at the Alpha Montreal, a 72. Here's a Maserati Merak, and I guarantee you that that has the Citroen Hydro Pneumatic uh, brake system in it. I don't remember if it has suspension components as well from that. This one has some pretty racy looking tires on it, so it looks like somebody's been uh, using the Merak, which is great. That's a Merak SS, so it's got a little bit more go. Also looks to have been fitted with some a little bit later Recaro seats, so that's a definite improvement to the seats in the Merak, unless I'm misremembering and they do have uh, Recaros, but a Uraco, uh, Lamborghini Uraco P250. Um, I have a 
prior business partner who just loves the Urakos. He'd love to have another one. Again, one of those cars that used to be really, really cheap, cheap fun, Italian package, a baby Lamborghini, and they've caught up. A Maserati Indy, 1971, 2 plus 2. And this has the slightly smaller engine than the Ghibli's, about 4.1. An ESO Revolta GT. You know, ESO, they were not loyal to any of the American manufacturers, so the ESO Revoltas had a uh, Chevy small block in them. I want to say a 327, 300 horse. Yeah, it looks like it. I'm just reading the info card real quick here. Another 2 plus 2 Ferrari, this time a 365 GT2 plus 2, another Enzo Ferrari special, also called the Queen Mother by some. A real luxurious Grand Tour from Ferrari. This one with Campagnolo knockoffs. And here we have a Maserati Mistral with Barani wires on it, red over black. Great color combination. Very nice car. Maserati Quattroporte. Four doors. Mark one. Quattroporte. 1967 Quattroporte. And again with the engine like you just saw in the Indy, the 4.1. An early Maserati Sebring. 1966. We don't see a lot of these. Two plus two Grand Tour. And we've come back around to the 3500 GT touring coach built car, Super Legera Touring. Three and a half liter. And I want to say that these cars are Lucas fuel injected. No, this one is not, but others were GTIs or fuel injected, and this is still a carbureted car. And this one has a uh, vinyl sliding sunroof fitted to the roof. Probably not original to the car. Uh, might be. But so we're going to take a quick look down below. We're going to get to those cars. You've got a lovely Dino Spider down below. Uh, looks to be chairs, no flares. We'll explain that in just a moment. But we're going to go back up. Or well, we haven't been up here yet. We're going to go up to the fifth floor of the museum. And I see a Bugatti. I think we've got some really choice stuff up here. So a 230SL. First car that caught my eye, Mercedes 230SL. Morgan 44 1600. Been involved in racing some of these cars. This car has it is right-hand drive, and it has also the English Morgan Sports Car Club badge on it. Had a lot of Morgans. My father still has one. A little mini pickup. Leyland Mini here. Not quite sure what year this exact car is. It's probably a few different years. Here we have an Enfield electric car. Unusual thing from England. Production of electric cars since 1966 until 1976. A Walsley, little known English car. The reason they wanted us to come up here is that it continued the 1930s. So we're back into cars of the 30s. An Alvis, a Sunbeam Talbot. I guess we should have followed their instructions, but hey, we had fun doing what we did. A Rolls Royce Wraith. Sedan, uh, so Wraith, instead of uh, Silver Wraith, Silver Wraith was later, the Wraiths were pre-war, so this is a 1939, appears to be a, I would say, Park Ward bodied car. It says first owner of this car was Sir Lawrence Olivier, real interesting, it does not state the coach builder, so I would say Park Ward. A standard eight Packard Sedanka town car, which means Sedanka. You've got the rear is covered and the front is not. It has a, a, a vinyl covering that goes over the driver's compartment. So the driver's compartment is leather and the passenger compartment usually because it's a formal car in the style of an old carriage, usually those cars are, uh, usually those rear interiors are cloth. 
So here we have a German car from the 1930s, very rare because of the war, an Adler Trumpf, a little junior, sporty little thing, kind of thing. You can picture a uh, fashionable German actor or actress or a young, successful businessman driving right before the unfortunate times of the Second World War. A BMW, also pre-war German, a 328. And this is a very unusual automobile. This is a car that appears to have been uh, bodied, and it is. It's a, it's Carrozzeria Touring, bodied, and probably intended for competition, may have raced. Very unusual, probably very valuable. And coming around to the Fraser Nash BMW, this is a recreation of a very well-known racing car. 1938. Bugatti Ventoux, uh, Type 57, 1934. Bugatti Type 44 Drophead. Older restorations, that's a 1930, probably restored 50 or more years ago. I love these Delages of this era. Uh, I sold an, a similar car, but even a rarer car, um, an Aero Coupe. But I just love the lines of these cars. Absolutely beautiful. And this was bought at an auction through in Great Britain. And we don't have a lot more information about that particular car there on that board. A Bentley. So immediate post-war Mark VI Bentley. One of the first. Looks like she needs a little love in the interior. I would say Park Ward body. No, James Young bodied. Very modern roof line actually on that, which uh, I should have known was James Young. A friend of mine had a James Young R-Type, which is the model right after the Mark VI. So very early Bentley Mark VI. Here we have an Alpha uh, 6C2500. I was going to guess 47, and I would have been right. It's the car that you saw uh, if you're an American movie fan. In The Godfather, Michael Corleone's first wife got blown up in one of these. Still never found out if they actually blew up a real one, but in 1972, they probably still weren't that valuable. A Bristol 401, really unusual car here. A lot of the styling, um, very European. Stole a little bit here and there from a pre-war BMW. Uh, these engines were also pre-war BMW in these cars. Very unusual coach work for their day. American in some ways, and continental European in others. The shape of things to come, as some of the American auto manufacturers said. Now a Triumph, and I've owned a couple of these Triumph Roadsters. It's a Triumph 2000 Roadster with the dicky seats and the little fold-up windshield in front of the dicky seats. I've owned almost an identical car auction in Great Britain did not come from a seller in Virginia or Georgia or Ohio where I've worked and sold cars like that. An Austin A90 Atlantic, 1952, pretty much the top of the line for Austin, a little sports sedan. Uh, some would say bizarre lines. Uh, I think these cars are absolutely great. They're very good driving. Uh, Sydney Allard, Allard P1 Saloon. The Allards are better known for their racing roadsters. Uh, this one has an early Ford uh, V8 engine, flathead V8, 85 horsepower. Later Allards had Cadillac engines and Lincoln engines used. I think I'm right. A Healy, Tickford bodied, 2.4 liter sports saloon, Donald Healy. A 1952 design by Healy. Uh, Healy went on to design cars for Nash, the Nash Healy. You see a lot of the cues in this car, and some of them even carried over. Just certain elements here, many years before the Austin Healy, a little roadster that's very well known that bore his name. From the American uh, department here, we have a first-year Ford Thunderbird, an early bird. 
a Chrysler Imperial Crown convertible 1959. A friend of mine drove one of these regularly in the States. Not pink, though. I don't think he'd be caught dead in that car. A Lincoln Premier from 1957. Just great lines, great big fins. A bond to keep. Bonds were uh, a small English manufacturer, and they used a lot of uh, parts bin parts from other manufacturers. This one looks like it could stand, or it was in the middle of a restoration here. And evidently, they're still working on it. So good for them. I hope they finish it. A Dodge uh, three-quarter ton light truck, a wartime truck. Unfortunately, just the chassis. Actually, this one appears to be a cutaway display. Mechanical display, cutaway, probably from the war years. They're displaying it to members of government, saying this is the truck that we're going to use to win the war. Just able to look inside this drop head here. And I think we've already looked at this Daimler. But just to get her from the front, if we've skipped it, it's a DB18 a drop head. It's a special sports coupe. Very pretty lines. Tickford, I think. Unusual little model there, a little cutaway model. A Lancia display model, technical display model, with little rams that allowed the body to lift up off of the engine so we can look down into it. No doubt done. Actually, doesn't seem to be rams. It's just on posts. But most likely auto show display example here or created for same. Let's see if they explain whether this was an original auto show display. Yeah, we don't know. This may or may not have been an original factory display, or somebody may have just created this to look like one. And it's still very neat. It's a great museum display. Backside of the Tickford and the Alpha and the Bentley, not necessarily in that order. Lotus Europa, John Player Special, and a Porsche. Both seem to be uh, projects that are being worked on, but that's great. Glad to see that these cars continue to get the love and care that they deserve. A lot of museums just let cars go. They just sit here, they're donated, whatever. So we're getting into the weird, wonderful world of the Greek-built cars. So here we've got Etzen Tonnako, 1980. Three-wheeler, two-seater, economical city car. Uh, Sachs, uh, 49cc single-cylinder engine. Uh, entirely Greek production apart from that. Uh, there's not much here. It looks like a miniature De Chevaux. So you thought a De Chevaux was small. This one's got one wheel in the back, and it's even smaller. Really bizarre little car. Alta, which is a joint uh, venture between the Germans and the Greeks. I hope we see a Mibia before the end of the day because I neglected to photograph my friend Myron's in Rhythmno. He has a Mibia, which is a, um, good Lord, um, the little one they made into a space shuttle on Top Gear. I'm having a brain fart here. Uh, Reliant, uh, English Reliant. Here we have a BMW Azetta 300, a very early Azetta ESO. Um, BMW bought these little cars from the refrigerator manufacturer and made uh, some of the first mass-produced German cars after the First World War, particularly ones that could be purchased by the impoverished public uh, trying to deal with the effects of the war. A Jowett Jupiter 1952, a classic Jaguar XK120 Roadster. Evidently, it was first exported to Spain, so it's not a U.S. car. It was in the UK, and now it's in Greece. A DB2 Aston, 1952. Early Aston Martin. Bentley S2, early V8 Bentley, same as the Silver Cloud 2, only with a little slightly sleeker uh, front-end treatment. A Bentley T Mulliner Park Ward Coupe, the predecessor to the uh, Corniche. Rolls-Royce and Bentley and Bentley Continental. This one fixed head, so 1966 to early 67 with that roof styling because the early cars were James Young. 
1980, they had the cars, uh, fixed head cars, and after that, they were all convertibles. Uh, Jag XK150, fixed head coupe with a sunroof. Pretty little car there. Mercedes 190 SL. Little baby brother to the 300 SL. A Borg Ward Isabella. I know a guy who was stationed in Germany for a little while and then brought one home and he says, a favorite car I ever owned. I said, that makes you unique. I've never heard anybody say my Borg Ward Isabella is a favorite car I ever owned, particularly among people who had a lot of cars. An Audi Auto Union 1000 SP. And these are little two-stroke cars, similar to the Trabant engine, but that's where that all came from, uh, was from their design. So very sleek styling, West German, not East German. Trabant was East German, glass fiber body. These are steel bodied, but they had that DKW uh, three-cylinder, almost 1,000 cc engine. They got up and went, similar to a Saab in a lot of respects. Bristol 405, we've got quite the Bristol collection here. This is an unusual saloon car. Real pretty, obviously right-hand drive, I think most were. A Lagonda 2.6, 1951. Unusual to see a Lagonda post-war. This, a uh, successful doctor or mayor's car, I guess you could say. Lagonda 3-liter drop head is a little bit later, 1955. That tall front end and that really attractive styling. Who is the style? Who is the... Uh, house on that one. It's Carrozzeria Touring. It's a very, very pretty Carrozzeria Touring on the Lagonda. A Daimler Dart had the Hemi, v has it got a Hemi in it? You bet it does. It's a two and a half liter Hemi V8. Unusual sh styling, has that fish mouth and it's got the little fins on the back. Definitely a love it or hate it car. Daimler Dart. Lancia Appia Lusso, 1961. A friend of mine, I believe, just sold one of these. A former uh, business partner had one in a shop not that long ago. A uh, Austin Healey. Remember the he Donald Healey downstairs? Well, here is one of Donald Healey's uh, final automotive creations. This is a 3000 BJ8 Mark III. I think Phase 1, Phase 2s came the following year. This one looks like it could stand uh, to have a little attention, but still a good display, good, good. Uh, Example, uh, an Israeli and English collaboration here, the Reliant Sabre 6 of 1963. You've heard of the Sabra, perhaps. That was the other Israeli car. But the, or the Reliant here, very unusual automobile. Interesting piece. A Jensen Interceptor, bad guy's car from the UK. You know, really powerful Chrysler V8. I want to say they used the 440 in that, 6.2. So that's not the 440. That's one of the smaller Chrysler engines in this one. Aston Martin V8 Series 3. These are cars that, until very recently, were undervalued. And they've become quite valuable. Again, this 1974 has the big Aston V8. Next to the Jensen Interceptor, that's a menacing pair. A lot of power there. Same kind of buyer back in the day. Sort of a, a uh, very successful bank robber's kind of car. So the upstairs here, the top level of the Hellenic Motor Museum. Very, very interesting display. Great display. Great to see. So we're going to head down now two flights. Have a quick rundown. Because that Dino is calling my name. See what else is with it. But they're proud of the Dino. They've got it on a very central display. And I see another little Abarth coupe down there. And a later Dino, the 308 GT4. <laughs> down the stairs we go. Long trip down. And we're surrounded by office space that's not occupied. Maybe they can expand the museum. So we'll save some of the best for last, or do we? Because back here, we've got a Ferrari 308, a little Magnum PI, GTSI. She's a 1980, so real early GTSI, first year injection on the 308. She's Rosso Corsa over Crema. 
lovely car. Nice driver quality example. Most of these cars are. That's what's so fun about them. You could take any of these out and go. Little Seata in the corner here, 1963 Seata. A Zagato. We love the Zagatos. Lancia Fulvia Sport, 1.3 liter V4 engine. Looks like she's uh, had a little competition time. She's got some racing harnesses in her. These are, I have numerous friends who love these cars, love to sports car race them, actually drove them every day, some of them around New York City. The Ferrari Mondial, early Mondial. Mondials are frequently overlooked, underrated examples of the Ferraris. This one in 1982. Uh, definitely one of the least desirable examples of the Mondial, but I tell you what, I love a Mondial coupe because it's got the back seats. You can put some groceries in the back of it and go shopping, and then you can drive like you got a 308. It really doesn't suffer a whole lot with the slightly longer wheelbase. Next to the Mondial, a 356A coupe. Ooh, it's a 55, so if it's a 55, it's not an A. It looks like an A, though, so it may not be a 55. It may be a late 56 or even 57. Uh, it's got a real sporty-looking exhaust on the back of it there. So a good little driver, 356, whatever she is. And then we're going to scoot around the back, and we're going to show you the rest of these. Go around the back of the Appia, Lancia. Got plexiglass side windows. Really good-looking Zagato styling on her. Yeah, Appia Zagato GTE Corso, 1961. Got the about 1100 cc V4. Great little sports car racers right out of the box, right when they were new. These were very popular. And so were the little thousand Zagato Abarths. This is a 1960. Again, it's not a double bubble roof car, but a really pretty little Zagato Coupe. These, are, these were very, very popular little race cars in the American racing circuits, some of the English racing circuits. Good car. The um, second iteration of the Dino, this 1974 308 GT4, has the Bertone styling. That was a very sharp departure from the earlier Dinos, and we're going to get to that Dino once we contrast this one with this one here. So this is also 1974. This is the last year of the Dino Spider. This one does not have the extended flares. So it has the, those Campagnolo wheels actually belong on a flares car. Uh, you can see you got a little extra jut there. And you have the Daytona style chairs. The interior is crema and it is not striped as many of the Daytona interior cars are. This one looks like it was kind of redone to taste. So bravo to the guy who did the car the way he wanted it. And the top is sitting behind the seats back there. A uh, very nice high-level driver quality example of the Dino Spider. And a Dino Spider, uh, not dissimilar to this, just sold for over $600,000, which is the going rate for, you know, really good Dino Spiders. We've got an interesting car here. This is a got the Ford uh, 1172cc in line, and it's a Super 2 Ford Sports Special. And this is one of these uh, hand-built cars where people would build parts of kits and suggest chassis and components to people who wanted to have uh, a little sports racing car. And this was 99 pounds, the kit that you got, plus you had to go source a whole bunch of stuff to make it. Uh, but an alternative to things like the Lotus 7, and really a contemporary to Lotus 7, and they made for unusual little sports racers. And it looks like it's been running some classic events too. So nice little car. I'd put a 1500 or 1600, probably a 1600 Kent uh, Crossflow, and it would probably take a little bit of re-engineering, but you know what Morgan's had, and obviously what uh, little Lotus Elans and stuff had, which were great little driving cars, had Crossflow engines. Those obviously had the Lotus engine, and it looks like we're finishing up with a little Abarth Simca 1300. And I've got a couple more cars downstairs, I think, if I can get to them, uh, but a little Simca 1300 Abarth. A Zagato bodied again. So the collection consists of a lot of cars, a lot of very interesting cars, a lot of early cars from the United States, from Britain, uh, England having had a major influence on Greece and the Greek automobile industry. Uh, shame we did not see a Mabia here. 
uh, I'm still trying to, I'm fighting with this because I, I know it as well as I know my own name, but, you know, sometimes I forget that too. Uh, but uh, there are some other Greek cars that are not well represented, so maybe Myron will donate his Mabea to the Hellenic Motor Museum. That would be really nice if he could swing that. Uh, he was trying to sell it privately. He wanted to keep it in Greece. And uh, I'm sure they've got other cars as well that are in other states of restoration. I'm not sure what else we can see here. So if I see anything else on the way out, I will restart this and we'll go from there. So just a few other things here in the lobby behind these strike doors, so it's kind of hard to make out. They've got a little F1 car simulator in the storage room. Evidently they've had it out before and uh, just don't have it right now. We've got this funny little Fiat Abarth uh, educational driving simulator from 1960 uh, roped off here for probably for special events and displays. Uh, they have a nice little gift shop here too so you can pick up car related gifts if you happen to be in Athens and you want to bring something home to that car girl or gal. You can bring your friends, your kids, heck even yourself and you all can jump in the Austin 7 and you can go for a little drive. We have a guy here who's enjoying uh, messing around with a little 1936 Austin 7. A friend of mine in the British motor industry, his happiest memories were in an Austin 7. It was his first car uh, when he went to work for Austin, the company itself. So just nice little touches scattered out throughout the lobby here. Obviously we love all the stuff from our friends at Ferrari. This looks like genuine Ferrari merch here. And uh, I do appraisal work for Ferrari myself, the company, so we love to see Ferrari stuff uh, getting out into the community. And just a last look around the uh, fourth floor, the main level here. I think we missed the bicycle. And so a lot of the wall displays, too, just, you know, great backdrops. And they tell a lot of the stories of a lot of the cars in here. So hopefully I picked enough of that up in the backgrounds, in the backdrops. I thought it was fun to start with the replica shop where they're working on the Austin. And as we go down, we'll try to pick up just a few more images uh, before we go back to the Metro. On this ramp where you can walk up to the museum, all these wheels actually end, not start, at the exit to the museum because it's the walk-up entrance. So one of the most interesting, some of the most interesting, are the first five, and it's the history of the wheel. So here we have a wheel used, and this one's dated uh, effectively 300 BC or 300 pre-Christ. And it says the wheel is probably the most important mechanical invention of all time. And here we have another antique wheel. We don't know who invented it. Paleolithic era. This is not even dated. It might be right at the time of Christ, right at the year zero. And this again may be 300 BC. Interesting carvings in it. 1890, a wagon wheel. Not much development of the wheel in almost 2,000 years. A little bit larger uh, farm carriage wheel here. And we went back in time again, 1770, for a, looks like an early uh, steam-powered military tractor from France. So the history of the wheel, the history of the automobile in Athens, Greece. I just want to say thanks for watching a special presentation, Travel with Chip, the Hellenic Motor Museum. Please subscribe, share. Appreciate all your support. Look at all the other travel videos. If you only caught onto this because it was a car video, shame on you. See a lot of the other travels I did the last three weeks when I made this particular series. Thanks again.